All right, so we're going to be studying Revelation chapters two and three. So you're going to open to that, and I'll read the, uh, about the seven churches. Uh, we'll start with the first church in Ephesus. To the messenger of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your works, your labor, and your patient endurance, and that you are not able to tolerate evil people. You have tested those who say they are apostles, but are not, and have found them to be liars. Indeed, you do have patient endurance. You have endured hardships on account of my name and have not become weary. But I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember, therefore, the state from which you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place if you do not repent. But if you do have this, you hate the actions of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious, I will give the privilege to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay, so we talked about these seven churches. These are the, the churches to whom the letter of Revelation is sent to. So remember, it's Jesus Christ's revelation to St. John that's sent to these seven churches. And uh, it's all about being delivered uh, to the messenger, to the pastor of each congregation. And you can kind of see with the map here of uh, how these are uh, being delivered. It makes sense. It's kind of like uh, I'm setting up my shut-in visits for this, this next week, visiting 20 people in three days. But I do it because I know where people live so that I visit people on the north side on Tuesday, I visit people out west on Wednesday, and then people around here on Thursday. Uh, so I'm not just driving all over the place. And that's what's going on here. So remember, John is on the island of Patmos. And then as the, you know, if, imagine someone walking or on a horse or a donkey going to each of these cities to the church in that city. So Ephesus is first, and then you'll see Smyrna, Pergamum to the north, and then you start heading east. All right, each of these letters typically have seven parts, though not every letter has every part. So we were talking before with a couple of us, uh, you know, the, these letters seem very similar, okay? But they're actually very different. They all have a you know, kind of an outline. Uh, you have the greeting uh, to the messenger of the church, and then a description of Christ, one or two sentences as Jesus describes himself. And then there's praise for the congregation's good points, condemnation for its bad points. There's a warning to repent, an exhortation to heed the message, and a promise to the faithful. Right. But not all of the churches have these parts. So going with verse, uh, verse one there, the description of Jesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lampstands. So that's picking, picking up on the picture language of Revelation chapter one. Who are the seven stars in Jesus' hand? The churches. Yeah, uh, I think the pastors. And then the seven golden lampstands, the churches. So look at that. You, you figured it out already. Jesus is the one who's walking among them. Uh, what do you think, verse 2? I know your works, your labor. Is that law or gospel? How does that make you feel if Jesus says to you, I know what you're doing? Okay. Or could it be? The gospel. I know what you're doing. I said it purposely one way. I know what you're doing. You know, imagine the way you say that to your grandkids, right? 
or I know what you're doing, you know, the good stuff you're doing. And that's the key with all of these churches. Jesus knows what they're doing and what we're doing. So the last question I'll ask, which with each of these letters is where do you see yourself and Christians in general in this church? And then where do you see us as a congregation as water of life? All right. Uh, so this is an image, uh, a, a real statue of Artemis of Ephesus. Okay. So Ephesus was an important center of Paul's ministry and mission work. He stayed there for three full years. Uh, this is the place of the riot of the silversmiths from the great temple of Artemis in Acts chapter 19. Uh, you have the, the great temple of Artemis or Diana. Uh, it's one of the great seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, Ephesus was the mother of the other congregations in the area. So kind of think of got churches in Kenosha, uh, Epiphany, New Hope. They all started from First Evan. Okay, they're the oldest congregation in the area, almost as old as the Synod itself. And we all came from them. All the churches that we just showed you, they all came from Ephesus. Uh, and this was then the hometown of John later on in his life. Then looking at these verses, uh, what words of commendation does Jesus give to the church in Ephesus? Repent. Yeah, so what's the criticism? I guess we'll start with the criticism then. What's the criticism? You have forsaken your first love. Okay, so what would be the first love? Now, God, yeah. his word, okay. yeah, salvation. So that's the criticism. And because you have forsaken your love, I'm going to remove that love. I'm going to remove Jesus and his word from you. I'm going to put out your lampstand. What's the commendation? What's the, the word of encouragement for them, though? They hate the practices of the Nicolaitans. Yeah, the Nicolaitans. So the Nicolaitans, and we'll see them in another letter, uh, it seems to be that they said, you can do whatever you want because you're going to be forgiven. Okay. So the commendation is that the members of the church at Ephesus were serious about holding on to the truth, that they examined the teachings of so-called apostles and then compared those teachings with God's word. And when they found those teachings to be false, then they excluded, they kicked out the false teachers. And then there is the promise in verse 7, uh, to the one who is victorious, I will give the privilege to eat from the tree of life. What does that mean? Heaven. Yeah, heaven. So Adam and Eve were barred from eating from the tree of life after they had sinned. But we'll see this later on in Revelation 21 and 22, that the saints will be able to eat from the tree of life in heaven, that they will have this <clears throat> paradise. All right, so now let's apply this. How do you see Christians today in the church of Ephesus? The commendation and also the criticism. Where do you see Christians say, forsaking their first love? They can be two towers. Okay, so there's criticism. They can be tolerant, yeah. Too much. You know, it's, it's, they're accommodated for not being tolerant. It's, yeah, well, so the, they're... Today, we're being too tolerant. Okay, so the, the, our criticism, we're tolerant. We're too tolerant. Yeah, in some cases. Yeah. Not always. Yeah, but a lot of times, what do we do? We're one way or the other, right? And we're that way with the kids and our grandkids. We come down really hard on our first kid. And then by the time we get to Alaska, ah, whatever, right? 
I'm tired. Okay, but we get that way too. As members, as Christians, pastors. What else? How do we forsake our first love? Yeah, from getting into God's word. Uh, you know, I, I shared the story the other day with someone just come, came to mind. Uh, one of the leaders of our congregation when I was in Kentucky, a young pastor, and we were coming back from a conference and I was telling him, you know, this is what I do during the day is you know, I spend like an hour reading God's word. I would pull out the people's Bible and I read the chapter and I read uh, all the commentary and so forth. And then I just do that for an hour. And he said very snidely, I wish I got paid just to sit and read. And I was thinking, that's what you pay me to do, right? You pay me to, to study God's word so that I know God's word, to share God's word. But that's their first love, right? Um, some false teachings uh, for Christians are that you're automatically going to be wealthy and happy. You know, that God has mm -hmm. promised us. That's not true. Yeah. Let's apply that to our church. Yeah, let's, uh, let's apply that to water of life. Where do we see, do we see water of life being the church in Ephesus? Do we have patient endurance? No, no. Yeah, no one has, yeah, no one is patient for with anything, right? Uh, there is a, a pastor that, and it happened to be a pastor that we called to be uh, one of our pastors in return to call, but he was reaching out on Facebook because uh, the things were just blowing up in his congregation. Uh, and you can see where, where people are, you know, with masks and mandates and rules and all this kind of stuff. And it doesn't matter where the, where the pastor or the churches comes down on those things, right? Because you might have one pastor that says, hey, we got to, this is a mandate. We're going to put masks on because that's what everyone's going to do. And then what are some of the members going to say? No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the masks aren't helpful or whatever. And then you're going to have a pastor that says, you know what? We're going to let people do whatever they want. We're going to be open and you guys do what you want. And then what are some members going to say? I'm not coming to church. I'm not coming to church. I'm upset of the pastor. I'm upset of people because we're not following. And it, it doesn't matter where you are, right? And I think what you said is exactly right. We're not patient. We're not enduring, all right? And, but it's not just water of life. That's any church. Because you, you probably notice I view things a little bit different than other pastors around here. And I, I had, I've had people that have, at least the few people that have spoken to me, not but rather they speak to me than speak about me. Uh, but those that have spoken to me, I got upset. And then I realized, you know what? People are in the other churches are upset with their pastor for being the opposite. So it's not anything unique. And so, yeah, we need that patient endurance, not so much uh, with false doctrine, but just with each other, I think. Anything else you want to bring up with this one? All right. Go to the letter to the church in Smyrna, starting with verse 8. To the messenger of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last, who is dead and came to life again, says this, I know your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy that comes from those who say they are Jews, but are not. Rather, they are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear anything that you're about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you'll be tested and you will suffer for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. All right. So what does it mean when Jesus describes himself as the first and the last who was dead and came to life again? Yeah, he's eternal. He's eternal and he died and he rose again. So what does he know about the congregation in Smyrna, about them being poor and suffering? What was their tribulation? Yeah. 
So the tribulation was that Christians or others were persecuting them. You know, maybe taking away their livelihood. Maybe they were just poor. And yet, what does it mean they were rich? How can they be poor and rich? They were rich spiritually. Exactly. I know the blasphemy that comes from those who say they're Jews, but aren't. Rather, they're a synagogue of Satan. Uh, so the Jewish synagogues should have been places where God's word was taught, where people were prepared for the coming of the Messiah. But many Jewish people rejected Jesus as the Christ and then used their synagogues to persecute the Christian church. And so then they were supporting Satan and not God. What does Jesus say is going to be coming upon the Christians in Smyrna? Verse 10. Yeah. After what? After suffering. Yeah. What does it mean for 10 days? That doesn't sound like that. I think any of us can handle 10 days of suffering. Are these 10 literal days? No. Yeah. You can put up with almost anything for 10 days, right? And then, you know, because you know it'll be over. Not you. <laughs> but are, are these 10 literal days in Revelation? No. So what does it mean then? A long, time. a long time. And a complete amount of time. 10 is the number of completeness in Revelation. So when God says enough is enough, he'll end it. Okay, so that's the key. Why is Revelation 2.10 so so memorable. Yeah, and pretty much every year when we have when we have confirmation, some student has this verse as a confirmation verse, don't they? Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Uh, Verse 11, what does it mean? He who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. What is the second death? Yeah. So what's the first death then? Well, it's the first death. So the first life that we're going to see later on is our conversion and our baptism. So the second resurrection then would be the resurrection to eternal life. First resurrection is being brought to faith through baptism or conversion. Second resurrection is to heaven. So our first death is being born dead in sin. So our second death would be eternal death in hell. But, but Jesus says, if you're faithful and you're getting a crown of life, you don't have to worry about that second death. All right, so what is the commendation that Jesus gives to the church in Smyrna? Yeah, and it's a poor church. Yeah, it's a poor church, and it's a sitting duck for the affliction that Satan is going to pour out on his members, and yet Jesus says they're rich. What's the criticism? That's a trick question. Why? Yeah, there is no criticism. This is one of two out of the seven churches there's no criticism. All right, so where do you see Christians in general fitting into this church in Smyrna? I think, you know, we all know that God is in control. That's how I always feel. Okay. Yeah. What else? How else do we see Christians in general? Maybe specifically you? But in general, endure your hardships and yeah. be faithful till death. Yeah, because they're going to go. This prison thing mm-hmm. is coming. Yeah, I think Christians in general suffering persecution. You know, we're going to see more persecution as we go through these churches. And I've talked for a long time 
that what we need in America is good old fashioned persecution. Okay, and now it looks like it's coming, right? It's here. It's, here. it's still not here compared to what it is around the world, but it's coming and it's here and it's gonna be getting worse. But to George's point, we see these Christians around the world uh, standing up for their faith, even though you've got uh, Muslims and so forth that are willing to behead them and do wor even worse things to their family as you're watching. And yet they're not going to denounce Christ. They're faithful even to the point of death. Uh, I met uh, one of the members from New Hope Now Water of Life, uh, Trudy, the other day. Trudy Werner. Okay. So she got kind of lost in the <laughs> shuffle as we were merging everything, but just a delightful lady, 96 years old. So same age as uh, our oldest member. Uh, and she knows, knows him really well. And it was just delightful because sitting up there and talking to her, because I was telling her stories about why we merged, how we came up with a name, the Unity Sunday service and so forth. And then she was telling me stories about how her husband, along with two others, uh, had started the church. They're the ones that found the land and, and found the six acres. And so it was really neat, being faithful to the point of death. All right, let's apply this to Water of Life. How do we see the members here at Water of Life being members of the church in Smyrna? Okay. And that's like to get watered down. Yeah. And what else? How else might we see our own, our own members being faithful to the point of death? Well, I think if, if you are ever with someone who's suffering, one of our members, you know, the prayer, the prayer requests, they, they just are flowing every week now. It gets longer and longer. Uh, but the people are faithful. Uh, but knowing that, uh, you know, they're suffering and yet they trust. So I was talking to one of our members. So her grandma just died. Her mom was going through a hand surgery. She has uh, her mother-in-law was going through something else too. And I just called her encouraged her and said, oh, I, I know, I know, pastor. Uh, I use Jeremiah where God says to Jeremiah, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And she said, and I didn't know this. She said, that was the, that was a text that the pastor preached for her grandmother's funeral the day before. So there's a good, there's a God thing, but just uh, explain to her, you know, God is working through you. Just remain faithful. So I am. I am so. Anything else you want to bring up on Smyrna? Then Pergamum. Uh, verse 12 To the messenger of the church in Pergamum, write, The one who has the sharp two edged sword says this I know where you live, where the throne of Satan is, and I know that you hold fast to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days when Antipas, my faithful witness, was put to death near you the place where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who instructed Balak to put a stumbling block in front of the children of Israel, that they would eat things offered to idols and commit sec sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have some people who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, which no one will know except the one who receives it. All right. So what does it mean when Jesus says in verse 12, he has the sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth? Yeah, so it's law and gospel. Jesus uses law and gospel coming out of his mouth. Uh, and he says, I know where you live, where the throne of Satan is. And I know that you hold fast my name. So they are holding fast in the face 
of persecution. You don't renounce your faith even when there is persecution, even when there's a martyr. We don't know anything more than Antipas except that he was a faithful witness who was martyred. And then he has this against them, that they were holding to the teachings of Balaam. So I've got a couple of things about Balaam from scripture on, on the screen there. And uh, where Balaam comes in is that you've got the children of Israel have escaped their slavery in Egypt with Moses. Now they're coming through the land of Moab and Balak, the king, is freaking out. And so he hires Balaam, who is a prophet, not a true prophet of God, but someone who you know, knows a lot about different world religions. He knows enough about uh, Judaism or the Old Testament God to call God by his uh, name, Jehovah or the Lord. And the Lord actually speaks to Balaam and says, you can't curse my people. And so it's, even though Balak hires Balaam to curse his people, three times ba Balaam gives a blessing to the people. So Balak says, well, what can you do? Because Balaam says, I can't curse them. I'm trying. Every time I try cursing him, it comes out a blessing. He says, here's what you do. Go and send your heathen women to the tents of the Israelite men seduce them, and then God will bring a curse on the people. And that's what happens. So that's what uh, Jesus is talking about here in that uh, the people there were getting involved in sexual immorality. And then again, the Nicolaitans were a cult and encouraged immoral living. So he, Jesus says, repent. And then what does it mean? When he gives the commendation at the end, whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He talks about hidden manna, a white stone, and a new name written on it. What is hidden manna? Well, just what is manna? Right. So who do you think is the hidden manna? Jesus. Jesus, the bread of life. Okay. A white stone, that's one we wouldn't know about. So there's a custom uh, that Greek jury members or judges, when they would, instead of like writing on a slip of paper, you know, innocent or guilty, they would take a white stone for innocent. So what does that mean for us and to the people in Pergamum is Jesus judges them as innocent. Not because they didn't do anything wrong, but because they were innocent based on his righteousness. And then a new name written on it. You think of people in the Old Testament that were given new names. Abraham. Abraham. Abram to Abraham. What else? Who else? Sarah, Sarah. Sarai to Sarah. So Abram to father, to father of many. What's that? Jacob and Israel. Jacob to Israel. The heel grabber to Israel being the one who, uh, being given the promise of the Savior. So what does it mean then that God gives these Christians in Pergamum a new name? And he's accepting them to himself. Yeah. And he puts his name on them. And, and, and a new name. So when were you given a new name? Yes. At your baptism. Okay. So what word of commendation does Jesus give to those in Pergamum? That's, verses, that's verse 13. Holding fast. Yeah. They held fast. They remained faithful even during the days of persecution. Where is the criticism? False teachings. Yeah. False teaching. Uh, they engaged in sexual immorality right in their midst, and they tolerated it. They let it go on. All right. So let's apply this to Christians in general. Where do you see Christians in general fitting into the church in Pergamum? False teaching. 
A lot of false teachings in our world. One of the podcasts I listen to weekly, it talks about uh, a different false preacher or preachers. Uh, the name of the podcast is What's Going On in American Christianity. And it, it's if you don't listen to that kind of stuff and you only listen to your Wells preachers, because a lot of our people, you know, they'll listen to me, they may listen to another Bible study, listen to time of grace, which is all good stuff. So you don't know what's out there. There's a lot of really bad stuff out there and people are listening to that stuff. What else? How about the sexual immorality? Do Christians put up with sexual immorality in our culture? Oh yeah. Try to make like homosexuality love. Yeah. Make it human. Yep. They make human sexuality or homosexuality love. Uh, I, I can see that happening when I go and talk to my seventh and eighth graders about that uh, because they've been influenced by the world. Oh, it's not that bad. And I just, what does God say? That's what I always do in class. What does God say? What does God say? Yeah, but what does God say? Yeah, but. No. <laughs> And if they're being infected by, well, so are we as adults. All right, how about us as a congregation? Where do you see water of life fitting into the church in Pergamum? Are we remaining faithful? You know, I hope so, but it's, it's tough. It's yeah, hard. It's yeah. You know, we're going through the growing pains of a congregation right now. I think we did that years ago in a mission congregation. You know, you, you grow, you grow, you get to a point and then, you know, it seems like the wheels fall off and it's tough and it's hard. And, you know, I think we're at that point now too, with the congregation, you're growing pains, just like in a family, you get, Hey, one, two kids is pretty good. You add that third or fourth kid in. It gets really hard. Even your grandkids, you can handle one or two and then you get three or four together. How do you do this? Okay. And, and it's hard. And you know, we're in the hard stage in the congregation right now. And yet for those like you and others remaining faithful. All right. Let's go to the church in Thyatira. What's that? To the messenger of the church in Thyatira write, the son of God, whose eyes are like fiery flames and whose feet are like polished bronze, says this, I know your works and love and faith and service, as well as your patient endurance, and that you are doing more now than you did at first. But I have this against you. You allow that woman Jezebel, the one who calls herself a prophetess, to deceive my servants and to teach them to commit sexual immorality and eat things offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she is not willing to repent of her sexual immorality. Look, I am going to throw her onto a bed and throw those who commit adultery with her into great suffering if they do not repent of her works. And it will put her children to death. And all the churches will know that I am the one who searches hearts and minds and that I will give to each of you according to your works. To the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who do not know Satan's deep things as they call them, I say that I will not lay any other burden on you. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and continues to do my works until the end, I will give him authority over the nations and he will rule them with an iron staff and shatter them like clay pots. Just as I myself have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Okay. So what does it mean in verse 18 that the son of God has eyes like fiery flames? He sees everything. His feet are like polished bronze. He has, he has power. He has power to crush the nations. And that fits later on when he says that those that remain faithful, he'll give them the power to rule over the nations because he has power over these nations. 
All right, who is Jezebel? Do you remember her from the Old Testament? Who, who was she? Was the, yeah, the Baal worshipers come in, right? right? The prophets of Baal, and she was the wife of Hezekiah or somebody. Ahab. Ahab. No. There it is. <laughs> yeah, so here's the bullet points. That's right. So Ahab was the king of Israel, wicked king, unbeliever. And he married Jezebel, an unbeliever. And then she brought with her the worship of Baal and Asherah, false gods. And then she killed God's prophets. Uh, she ordered Naboth's death. Remember when Naboth wanted, or you know, King Ahab, her husband wanted Naboth's vineyard. He wouldn't sell it to her and him. So then uh, Jezebel had him killed. She went after Elijah, after Elijah had the prophets of Baal and Asherah killed on Mount Carmel. So she actually practiced witchcraft. And then uh, right after Ahab died, then she died when she heard the news that her husband had died and she fell out the window and the dogs licked up her blood and, and ate her. So in the New Testament, she's pictured as a prophetess, a false teacher. So she's looking at the secret things of God. So trying to, you know, think of... Uh, you know, witchcraft, Ouija boards, voodoo, all that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of stuff that's infecting that church in Thyatira, that there's someone there, whether her, her name probably isn't really Jezebel, but there's someone there that is pictured like Jezebel being involved in this kind of stuff. So what, uh, what does it mean then at the end I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with an iron staff. What kind of blessing does God give to those who remain faithful? Yeah. And what does he give to you? He gives you that power that you get to rule over the nations at the end. All right, let's look at the commendation. Verse nine, it's a short one. What was going on in Thyatira? More faithful than they did at first. And God's causing them to grow. And then what is the criticism? The criticism is they allowed people who engaged in immorality of temple worship to remain in their congregation. So evidently you've got this prophetess, again, probably not really named Jezebel, who's convincing a number of members that she knew uh, the deep secrets of the faith. And this these deep secrets of the faith probably revolved around idol worship and immorality. All right, so let's apply that to Christians today. And, and maybe even let's go right to our church, Water of Life. Where do you see us fitting into the church in Thyatira? Hmm? No, I'm hoping I don't really see any of our members involved in witchcraft. Maybe you guys know of anyone. Okay, I don't think we have that problem, but I hope we are growing. And I think our people do work. Uh, what, what's one of the things that we need to do better as a church? I think we need to get, like any church, get more people involved, right? So it's not just you, because you get tired. Uh, but you get more people involved. And God blessed us last year. Uh, we grew by leaps and bounds, which was crazy because we didn't really do a whole lot of outreach. And yet God caused the congregation to grow. So it can kind of sustain some people transferring to other churches nearby because they've moved and so forth. Uh, but to grow and then to be more active. Uh, and like I, I told the story before we started recording of the church down in Boone County, Indiana. You know, we pray that 
got, first of all, that we get all the paperwork in so that we have a, uh, so the way this works is we get all the paperwork in to the mission board and the chairman, which is me. So I have to write the paperwork and I have to prove it. And then we send it on to the board for omissions in February. And then they're working to look at everything there and all the other 12 districts to see about starting new congregations. And then if they're approved, then we'd be calling a, a pastor and so forth to work there. And the neat thing is that uh, our church body has just approved this, that uh, in Synod Convention, we want to start 100 new missions over the next 10 years. That's a, that's a big deal, 100 new missions. And like Pastor Ulhorn, our mission counselor said, if we don't get 100 new missions, but we start 80, that's still really well. And if, if you know my daughter, Miriam, I know Dave and Sandy know Miriam really well. Uh, she is just so mission-minded. She's a senior in college and she's gone on mission trips and so forth. She called me up after watching that Wells Connection and said, hey, dad, uh, I watched this video. Have you ever thought about getting back into the mission field? Because you, you started a mission field once. I said, yeah, I know I do. I said, but I can't just get into the mission field. I need a call. I can't just say, you know what? I want to start a new mission and go somewhere. They, they have to call. But it was just kind of neat that here's this young lady that's on fire wanting to grow the kingdom of God. And that's what all of us want to do, not to grow water of life. Obviously, we want that to happen, but grow God's kingdom. All right, let's go to the next chapter. The church in Sardis. To the messenger of the church in Sardis, right? The one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what is left, which is about to die. For I have found that your works are not complete in the sight of my God. Therefore, remember what you received and heard. Hold on to it and repent. If you don't wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time it will come upon you. Yet you have a few names in Sardis, people who have not defiled their clothes. They will walk with me in white clothing for they are worthy. The one who is victorious in this way will be clothed in white clothing. I certainly will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so what does it mean in verse 1 when Jesus describes himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars? What does it mean, the seven spirits of God? That's the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold Holy Spirit. So he has this, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit works through the seven stars, which are the pastors. What was, well, let's we'll start right, right away with a word of criticism. What word of criticism does Jesus give to the church in Sardis? They're dying. They're lukewarm. They're not doing much. Yeah. Well, actually, they're doing a lot, right? They're vi they seem vibrant and alive, but really, what are they? Yeah. They're dead. I, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive and you're dead. Where's the commendations? Because this one's a little different. The, most of the churches, there's a the commendation and the criticism. This one, Jesus gives a criticism. And then the commendation. What's the commendation for Sardis? So even though they appear strong and vibrant, they're really dead. There's a remnant, there's a few yeah. left. There are a few that are left. They're strong and active in their faith. And then what blessing does Jesus give in verse 5? If you are victorious to so those few that are remaining victorious and are alive, what's he going to do to them and for them? Acknowledge him before his father. Yeah. That's a big thing. I would have missed that. Well done, my good and faithful servant. What else? Yeah. 
Yeah. You and I, we don't have our deeds written in the other book. The other books that are written have all of the deeds of those who are unbelievers. But in the book of life, it's only our name. You know, Michael Zarling. I, I always tease. Uh, so if you know, there's a Mark Zarling. He used to be the president at Martin Luther College. He used to be a professor at the seminary. MLC president and so forth. And, you know, I have Mike Zarling. And so I just always tell people if I want to get anything accomplished in the, in the Senate, I just write M Zarling, hoping they think it's Mark Zarling. And if you get upset with me, I'm going to put M Zarling down too. Uh, put my name down. You know. uh, and then the white clothing that were baptism. So Pastor Hagen, so he's the one that does these podcasts for us for the thirsty podcast the two weeks ago he reached out to me because he had uh, a young baby i don't remember how many in one soul but just say three or four months old that died crib death you know said sudden infant death syndrome and so he had to do the funeral so i uh i sent him the funeral that i had done for one of our children that was that died a week after birth and uh, he said that the baby was going to be was going to be buried in her baptismal gown. What a powerful testimony! You don't even have to preach a sermon. I haven't listened to a sermon yet, uh, but what a testimony of mom and dad's faith, right? This little girl is in heaven because of her baptism, because God washed her sins away gave her that white clothing symbolized by the baptismal gown, that's what you and I get in heaven. All right, how about, uh, about our church in Water of Life? Where do you see us as members of Water of Life fitting into the church in Sardis? We kind of hope not. How so? Because <laughs> so many of them were dead. Yeah. There's a remnant. <laughs> but do you see that here and you see that in other churches what do they say what's the 2080 rule in churches the 2080 rule 20 percent of the people do 80 percent of the work 20 percent of the people support 80 percent of the ministry right that's not water but that's almost any church of any church body and you can have churches that look really vibrant. They got a school, they got a youth group, they got this or that, and they're really active. And yet, what's the problem? Or what can be a problem? As members are not in God's word. As families. That's the big thing. It's not so much that the, the members aren't in God's word and Bible study in church. It's that the parents aren't in Bible study at home with their kids having devotions, praying with them, just having conversations. And that's kind of a neat thing with Belle. You know, we tease Belle all the time, our youngest daughter, uh, you know, that she's stuck home with mom and dad all the time. You know, Friday night, 9.30, mom and dad are in bed. <laughs> uh, and yet, what a, what a neat thing that when we're uh, taking her home uh, from practice and so forth, she's talkative and she wants to talk, which is cool as a teenager but then to have spiritual conversations. But that's the key is a lot of times you see Christians, you see churches, they look really active and yet they're dead inside because they're not in God's word. All right, last two churches. To the messenger of the church in Philadelphia, right? The holy one, the one who is true, the one who has the key of David, the one who opens and no one can shut and who shuts and no one can open, says this, I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door, which no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Look, I will make those who are from uh, the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but are lying. Look, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them realize that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, which is about to come over the whole inhabited world to test those who dwell on the earth. 
I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will never leave you again. I will also write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. All right, what does it mean to have the key of David? So that's going back to Old Testament in that Eliakim, he had the key of King David's to open up the storehouses so that he could give food to the people of Judah. Okay, He could lock it and say, you're not worthy. You're not one of God's people or open up. You are one of the people. And then the door. No one can shut this door. If Jesus has it open, there's no one can shut it. What words of commendation does Jesus give to the members in Philadelphia? He will keep them from the hour of trial that is going to come. Yeah. He knows their deeds. They have patiently endured and he will continue to be with them and bless them as persecution is coming, not just on them, but on the entire world. But what criticism does he have for this church? There's a tricky question again. They, they receive no criticism. Yeah, he kept his word. So even though Philadelphia was small, it's a small city, so probably a very small church, and yet it had the strength to take advantage of the open door and no weaknesses in this congregation are mentioned. Uh, the members are warned to hold on to their crown. Jesus wants a church that faithfully proclaims his word. Uh, what does it, so what does it mean to make a pillar in the temple of my God? Why would, why would you want to be called a pillar in the temple of God? You're strong. Yeah, you're strong. You're holding up the church. Uh, what, does it, what does it mean that God writes his name on you? We saw before about having a new name. What does it mean that God writes his name on you? He's your child. You belong to him, right? Yeah. I think of, come on, you all seen the movie Toy Story, right? Right? You, yeah, that's a good movie. What did Andy do with Woody? Wrote his name on it, right? Wrote his name on his foot. And then what did he finally do to Buzz? Wrote his name on, right? They belong to him. And that's what God does to us. All right, where, where do we as Christians and members at Water of Life fit into the church in Philadelphia? Well, I hope and pray that we're patiently enduring, right? Because like I said before, is persecution coming? Yeah. What, what kind of persecution do you see coming on us as Christians in America? Just give me some examples. You're going to be in trouble if you ever say anything against our beliefs, like pro-life, mm -hmm. you know, like the abortions, the homeless, you know, the LGBTQ. You know? Yeah. So if we say anything against LGBTQ, uh, pro-life, so we were talking about this in our WS administration meeting the other day, we have to bring it up at our joint council and then bring it up in our churches, is you know, the Wisconsin Senate has created documents for schools and churches to use to kind of protect us. That if you know, there's a student in our school, uh, high school, if there's parents and so forth, and then you now they come out as gay, or even our, we have employer employees. Maybe not our teachers, but you know if we have members who do aftercare, our aides are working as janitors or in the lunchroom and so forth. And now they're living a lifestyle that isn't what we would live as Christians. Whether a man and woman living together, 
or they're two men or two women or whatever. And now we have legal recourse to say, you can no longer work here. But in our culture, if you fire someone for that, you, you can't do that, right? In a, in a secular workplace, you have to put up with it. In the church, we, we can do that, but we better have legal recourse too, we better have documents written because uh, the way our culture is going, it won't matter. What else? Where else do you see persecution coming, George? If you see Christianity at odds with other religions, you're a racist or something. No, it's... Yeah. To say that Christianity is the only way is supposed to be, yeah, that would be classified as racist today. And you see that, don't you see that in history books? When Christopher Columbus or the Spaniards came over, now in the history books, it's all about how evil they were, the white man to the Native Americans and so forth here, as opposed to in, in the past, we taught, uh, you know, there were bad things that happened, but they also brought the gospel. Okay. Any other things you see persecution coming on the Christian church? Yeah, and I think it can happen with what's going to happen with a, a it'll happen first in our schools of having a bathroom for trans people, having ba- having athletes or trans athletes, and then forcing them. Uh, first, it would first be like at the college level for MLC and WLC. Then it'll filter down to a high school like Shoreland, then our grade schools. So it'd be that. Uh, that it could to get to the point of that the pastor would have to say, uh, we have to do a gay wedding. And if not, we're gonna take away your tax exempt status, All right? This was several years ago, down in Texas, there was a female mayor that was requiring all the pastors to send in sermons for the government to review, to make sure that they didn't have this kind of stuff about homosexuality and so forth in there. Okay, all of those kind of things that is really against the law with the First Amendment, and yet they come down on Christians. And even saw this last year when uh, I just was reading a paper on this, you know, when there were so many lockdowns and there was so much inconsistency. You know, if, it was one thing if everything's locked down, but when there's inconsistency, for example, a Catholic priests we're not allowed to go and give communion at someone else's house, okay, one-on-one. And yet uh, it was allowed to have the pizza places go and deliver one-on-one their pizza to that same house, okay? And so those things were challenged in court of saying, you can't do one and the other. They even went to the Supreme Court where one of the justices came down. I think this was in California saying, you can't have liquor stores open and on Sunday and churches closed. Okay. All right. The last one. <clears throat> to the messenger of the church in Laodicea, right? The amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation says this. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. If only you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and not hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have become very wealthy and need nothing, but you do not know that you are miserable, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness may not become public and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. I rebuke and discipline those whom I love. So take this seriously and repent. Look, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will go in with him and dine with him and he with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father in his throne. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So now Laodicea is near the city of Colossae, where we get the, the letter to the Colossians. It was known for its hot springs. What problem do they have in Laodicea? Because this is the church where they receive no commendation, only criticism from Jesus. Just 
being mediocre is not acceptable. Yeah. You're probably tolerant. And comfortable. Comfortable? Yeah. Tolerant. Lukewarm. What does it mean? He'd rather have them cold or hot instead of lukewarm. You know, how we can understand. You're on fire for the Lord, but why cold? Maybe because then you can really tell them, yeah. really reprimand them. Yeah. So, for example, what is the opposite of love? Hate. Is it really? Okay. <laughs> What's the opposite of love? It's not hate. Mm, paying no attention at all. Yeah. Antipathy. Um, right? Indifference. And indifference, if you don't care, you can't change it. Uh, you know, think of someone who is, maybe you've had these kind of issues with a family member who's addicted, say, to alcohol. And can you get that person to change? Maybe or, or smoking or whatever it is, can you get them to change? No. They're lukewarm, they're indifferent. What needs to happen, sadly, a lot of times? They have to hit bottom. Yeah, hit bottom. You know, I, I know that I've, I've heard stories of, you know, the gentleman who was an alcoholic. Finally, his wife just packed up and moved the kids out of the house. He came home. Everything's empty. Everyone's gone. Then he didn't touch a drop of, water, of alcohol. He didn't have to go to AA or anything like that to tell him he had a problem. Okay. He hit rock bottom. He was cold. And that's what happens to happen with us as Christians. Jesus says, you're lukewarm. And then uh, look at the end of there. He stands at the door knocking. What does that mean? He's standing at the door knocking. Yeah. So, Deb, don't you have a, a picture of this up at St. John's? What does that mean? Is there's a is a stained glass window in the front of your church of Jesus, or is it a painting? Painted. So, at St. John's in Old Creek, where she goes to church, there's a painting of Jesus knocking at the door. I've talked to Pastor Rex and her pastor. What does it mean? What is the imagery of Jesus standing at the door? You have to accept him. Yeah, you welcome him in. You don't do anything, right? You open the door. He's there. He's knocking. I'm coming to bring salvation. All you have to do is not say no. Open the door. Let me in. And when he comes in, what do you get to do with him? What does it say there? Talk with him and dine with him. You know, I, I ate a Cracker Barrel yesterday for breakfast. That's been a long time to eat a Cracker Barrel. Uh, that was a big breakfast. Mm -hmm. I, I went with the Grandma Sampler. Okay, it, just because it had Grandma's name and it had a, you know, it was like three kinds of meat and pancakes and eggs and I don't know what else. And then some others got grits and so forth. But you know, that's a heavy breakfast. My usual breakfast is a fruit smoothie. You know, banana, milk, strawberries, and mango or pineapple. I make it for Bella and myself. You know, that's my usual breakfast now. To have something like you know, comfort food. Well, now imagine sitting down and having whatever that really good meal is. Or tomorrow night where you know, Miriam's coming home and she's standing up in one of her best friend's weddings. You know, I'm going to guess there's going to be good food at the wedding. And that's probably a better picture than Cracker Barrel. But going to the wedding feast... You got this really good food, you're served, you're there. And that's the picture of Jesus, right? In heaven, in heaven, we get to dine with him. We are the bride, we are the guests, and he's the bridegroom. All right, where do you see us as Christians and as a church are being lukewarm? Yeah, what's the problem? Uh, we're too comfortable. Yeah, we're comfortable. What makes us so comfortable in America? Wealth. Wealth. That's the problem that was going on later. See, they're wealthy. And when you're wealthy, what don't you need? Nothing. You have everything you need. You think you do. Yeah. <laughs> he says you don't have my goals. 
Yeah, you don't have Michael. That's exactly it. They have gold, but they don't have Jesus gold. You know, I think of the first church. Yes. You know, how many Christians they may not verbalize this is I'm fine the way I am. And when I need help, then I'll come. I, I've had lots of people, you know, your age and so forth. So it's not the younger kids. A lot of times it's the older people that, you know, I try and try and try to get to Bible study. And they'll say, you know, pastor, I learned all that when I was in catechism class. When it changes, then I'll be back. What? They're lukewarm. Get your butt in church. Get your butt in the, in the pews for Bible study. Read the Bible on your own. Be lukewarm. But isn't that a good description of Christianity in America? That we're lukewarm. Well, when we look at after 9-1-1, everybody went to church. Yeah. yeah, exactly. After 9-1-1, everyone went to church. You would have thought that would have happened with uh, coronavirus last year, right? Did it? No. And, and now, you know, some people stayed away because they were told to stay away. But still, you would think, hey, now you're able, when you're able to come back, to go back. And we didn't get drawn in. By, by whatever this was. And that's the thing. We just stay lukewarm in our faith. And that's something that affects me. Maybe it affects you. I know it affects so many Christians in America, especially. Uh, and then it's also in Europe. You know, those churches in Europe, they're empty. They're showpieces. You go to Europe to look at the churches because they're empty. And we don't want that to happen to, to our churches. But speaking of churches that remind me of we were talking about yesterday with that mission field in uh, Boone County, uh, Indiana, is it's expensive to start a church. It could be like a million dollars uh, with the pastor, and then you buy the land, and you got to put up a church. And what's interesting is what a number of churches are doing, and we we're already looking at this, is to start a church with a core group. So like you guys would be the core group. You know, if, if, this, if we were starting a church and I said all we have is your, this group here, and we had the funding and everything, I think the mission board would, would start with you people being active, okay? That's what we're looking at down in, in Boone County. Well, we're gonna meet. Uh, we're not gonna meet right away in a worship service. Uh, I've told, I told this to one of the people that we talked about, talked to uh, in Boone County. I said, you know, if you have, what do we have? Two, four, six, eight. If we had like 15 people for worship service, that's like a cult. Right? If, the, if 15 of us sat in church, it looked like a cult for a service. Be a 15 people in, say, Sally's home for Bible study. I don't know how big your home is, but it probably crammed in there, right? That's a good group for Bible study. And so that's where we start with Bible study in someone's home. You get on fire for each other. And then you get to a critical mass of like 30 or 40. Then you start, maybe you rent a storefront, uh, maybe a coffee house or a school building for worship services. Uh, and we saw, you know, different buildings to kind of convert into churches instead of building one. We saw one yesterday. Uh, it was an old uh, mechanic shop. You could see you could just tell the way it was. And they even had the, the bay windows for the, where you drive the vehicles in. That was an entrance for the church and so forth. Uh, you know, there's different ways. Oh, one of our new missions out West, I think it's in Colorado. They bought a tire shop and it's perfect for their church. So just those kind of things, because it doesn't matter what the church building looks like. Because, and I told this to one of the people, the church is God's people. So, uh, and, you know, God grows his church when we're not lukewarm, when we're on fire. All right. Anything with this? All right.